Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, first in a series of conversations hosted by Canada 2020 called Democracy in the Digital Age. I'm Anna Ganey, Executive Chair of Canada 2020. I'm uh, joining all of you from my home in Montreal, and uh, I thank uh, all of you for joining us from your homes uh, across the country today for this uh, important conversation. Um, we are just launching this uh, important uh, series, and this is the first uh, of, I hope, uh, a number of uh, such conversations. So if any of you are joining us today who have a particular interest uh, in this uh, series and have ideas or feedback for Canada 2020 on uh, how we can continue to build this out, please uh, don't be shy to reach out and uh, send us your thoughts and feedback. I would uh, love, to, love to receive that. Um, I'm uh, really thrilled today to have with us uh, the Honourable Stephen Gilbo, a Minister of Canadian Heritage and a Member of Parliament for the Riding of Laurier Sainte Marie here in Montreal. Uh, along with uh, the Minister, we are thrilled to have uh, Anya Caradaglia. She is the Parliamentary Reporter uh, of the National Post, also in Montreal these days uh, due to COVID. And um, so I thank you both for uh, joining us today and our uh, audience to uh, talk about uh, addressing online harms, a really important topic uh, and it's uh, front of mind uh, in the context of uh, democracy and, and public debate and um, how, we, uh, how we protect speech and also uh, limit the harm uh, that some of these platforms uh, have allowed to flourish in certain uh, environments. So, uh, following that, we have an excellent uh, a panel that will be uh, weighing in on these issues as well, and I will let uh, Anya introduce uh, all of them to you uh, when the time comes. So uh, before I hand things over uh, to Minister Gilbo, I just want to let you know that um, we would love to hear your questions. So if you're watching on Zoom, please use the Zoom uh, Q&A function to send those uh, in to us or on Facebook, I believe you can do it, uh, send your comments through, uh, questions through the comments feature on uh, Facebook, excuse me. So we will try to get to as many of you as possible. We look forward to your questions. Let us know where you are. Uh, if you do submit a question, it's always nice to hear uh, where folks are joining us from. So on that note, um, I will turn this over to uh, Minister Gilbo and uh, thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you all for, for, for being here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I am very happy to be here with you today to discuss these important issues, um, which indeed have a direct impact on our democracy. Um, I, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from uh, my home in Montreal on the traditional territory of the Mohawk and other Odeshani peoples. Uh, democracy includes inclusive and accountable governance, Peaceful pluralism, pluralism and respect for diversity and human rights are core values shared by Canadians. Every day, Canadians use online platforms to connect with family and friends, stay informed and participate in debates and discussions. Over the past decades, uh, even more so over the past year, Canadians recognize the need for platforms to work in ways that foster a safe and inclusive online environment. Online hate, it's not, a, it's not an opinion. It harms, it kills, it robs people of their dignity and our children of their right to thrive. We're working on three distinct yet interrelated initiatives that seek to modernize our legislative framework for the online world. First one being uh, Bill C-10, which would amend the Broadcasting Act. That last reform of the act was in 1991 uh, before internet was widely available in Canada. Online streaming services have dramatically changed how Canadians discover, access, and consume television, movies, and listen to music. The main objective of the measures in the proposal is to ensure that online and traditional broadcasters are treated fairly and equitably. It is critical that Canadians see themselves reflected in the news, stories, and music they consume. Right now, these policy objectives are carried by our conventional TV networks and radio stations. Moving forward, all players need to make a fair contribution so that services like Netflix and Spotify will also have to contribute their fair share. Uh, another relates to news compensation. 
creators of news content, holding our institutions accountable and promoting healthy de democratic debate in our society fail to be compensated properly by the web behemoth who are amassing ridiculous amounts of profits. When these news organizations try to negotiate, they either get told we will pay for this and, and that media, but not the small regional news outlet. Or they're told, if you're not happy, put up a paywall. Paywalls probably work for the handful of large metropolitan outlets which target high income professionals, but the strength in our fourth estate lies in numbers and diversity, not just on big institutions. A healthy news sector is central to any democracy. This is why we are committed to establishing a comprehensive and inclusive framework. And third, there's the work our government has been doing over the past few years to combat online harms. We are now developing legislation to deal with online harms to address hate speech, child sexual exploitation content, terrorism content, content that incites violence, and the non-consensual sharing of intimate images online. During the pandemic, digital platforms are more than ever at the heart of how we communicate with one another and stay connected. As Canadians spend more time online, they also can find themselves exposed to harmful content that can perpetuate crime and trickle into our lives. Both the right to freedom of speech and the right to security of the person are two important pillars within our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Neither is optional for our government. News regulations for online platforms are needed. Despite their many benefits, online platforms can be abused by bad actors intent on inciting hate, promoting violence and extremism, or engaging in other illegal activities. Furthermore, hateful speech online silences voices and undermines democracy. We've seen too many examples of public officials retreating from public service due to the hateful online content targeted towards themselves or even their families. Based on a national survey from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, we know that the vast majority of Canadians are worried about hate speech online and that the government should be doing more to prevent hateful behavior online. I have seen firsthand alongside other Canadians, the damaging effects harmful content has on our families, our values and our institutions. As a dad and a stepdad to six kids, I know more can and should be done to create a safer online environment. But it is not only Canadians who are determined to act. We are joined by other countries in this pursuit to create a safer and more inclusive online environment for all users. Online harms know no bound borders. The issues are not isolated and we can learn from previous successes or difficulties faced by countries. These initiatives all play an essential role in guaranteeing Canadians are able to participate fully directly and indirectly in the democratic process, whether it be by updating the broadcasting or regulatory policies, ensuring that our media is fairly compensated or providing a safe online space for Canadians. Discussions like this one are happening throughout our society and across our government. So I'm really honored to be here to open this series of conversations that are vital to the strengthening of our democracy. Thank you. Minister Gibber, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um, I wanted to start off with, with, a, with a general question. You know, we're here to talk about reducing the harms of digital technology on democracy and public life. And we've spoken about some of the legislation that you'll be bringing forward, and we'll talk more about that. But just to start off with, I wanted to address the issue in general. You know, what are the threats that digital technology is currently posing to our democratic institutions? When you look at this as an issue, what are the main threats that you're concerned with? Well, I, there there are a number of uh, of threats. I mean, I I think front and center for every legislator or most legislators around around the planet is what we we seen in Washington on on January sixth, uh, where clearly uh, groups uh, were able to, to to organize and and mobilize um, in an attempt to overthrow a democratically elected government. Uh, 
if further proof was needed that uh, that collectively around the world and certainly in Canada, we need to act to 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 to, to, to put in place better systems to to ensure that um, we we maximize the benefits of these platforms to our, to our society while working really hard to try to minimize uh, the, the harmful aspect that 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 has evolved uh, over those platforms I, I think this is this is something that that we are very very worried about uh certainly in in terms of uh in terms of online harms uh, obviously um I mean, there are other aspects that, that, as a legislator, we are very, very worried about. Clearly, when you look at the data, um, if you're a woman, if you're a racialized person, you are three to four times more likely to be to to to, to, be, to be the target uh, of online violence. And and what we're seeing is is that um, you know the. the this dream of, of of this free platform where we could have those open discussions well that that dream for many is turning into a nightmare and and people are just more and more people are are, are simply deciding to 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 take themselves out of that public debate because because the conditions under which we're asking them to participate simply aren't sustainable uh, so, so those diverse those diverse voices that we would want that uh, to hear on on the on the online platforms that we need to hear um, well, are are more and more being silenced by I mean we know it's a minority of uh, of actors but a very a very organized a very loud minority and and something must be done. And as you're, you know, trying to figure out how, how to do that, something, how to tackle this, you know, I, I'm, there's a lot of concerns that people have expressed about, uh, you know, government overstepping. As soon as you start talking about regulating, legislating, um, you know, things that affect the internet, people start becoming concerned about freedom of expression, internet freedoms, maybe net neutrality issues like that. So as you've been working on this legislation that's coming up, um, you know, is this something you've taken into consideration? And if so how have you taken it into consideration in developing this legislation? Of course, the, this is something we, we are very mindful of. Um, as I said earlier, freedom of speech is a, is a core value of our democracy, but, but the safety of our citizen is as well. And, and, it, and, and while, while looking at this, what we're trying to do is to, to try and make sure that we are not compromising one to, 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 to support the other. And in fact, uh, one could argue that um, by not acting, we are in fact uh, not ensuring a great number of Canadians freedom of expression and freedom of speech uh, because they can't express themselves uh, on, on, on these platforms the way they the way they in a in a safe m manner and the way they 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 have a right to um on the one hand on the other hand i think that i mean what to to, to use a, a bit of an image we have a bodies of of law and regulations that <clears throat> That that uh, encompasses how we deal with, with with these issues in the physical world, um, and, and and we have freedom of speech in Canada, but we have you know, laws and we have jurisprudence dealing with how freedom of freedom of speech doesn't mean you can you can't say anything to anyone. There are limits, and I, and I think what we're doing is we're we're really just trying to to to, to take. The, this body of of of, of laws and, and jurisprudence and and from the physical world and and bring it to the to the online world um, so we're not trying to silence people that's not what we're doing <clears throat> we believe in freedom of speech but we believe in uh, in safety and in security of our citizens as well so uh, for this upcoming, this online harms uh, le uh, legislation, um, what can you tell us about where you're at? When can we expect that? Where is that in the process right now? Um, it's a joint effort by, by many ministries and, and, and ministers of um, my team and I've been working very closely uh, with um, the Justice Minister and Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti, and 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 his team, we've uh, we've done joint consultations. Both 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 our offices started going back uh, la last year. Um, other other ministers and ministries are involved. Um, Minister Blair, Blair at Public Safety, um, Minister Champagne uh, from, from Ministry of Innovation, uh, Minister Monsef as well. Um, 
uh, status of, of of women. So it, it's a it's a multi multi ministerial ap approach to to this. And I mean, we are in the final stages of uh, of, of developing the, the the legislation, which should be tabled in 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 the coming weeks. And can you tell us a little bit more about the consultation process for this? Because there wasn't a public consultation. There wasn't, uh, you know, Canadians couldn't, there was no mechanism for Canadi Canadians, for example, to submit, uh, to submit their views. So, so who did you consult with and what did that process look like? Um, so a number of ministries were involved in the, in, in the consultations. Um, we've consulted with uh, civil society organizations that are involved in in uh, in in these five categories of uh, of uh, of illegal uh, online activities that would be defined in 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 in, in the bill uh, and i i presented them in in my introductory remarks um we've consulted academics uh we've we've uh, we've consulted um organizations that are more preoccupied by uh civil liberties uh freedom of speech um, human rights organizations, Amnesty. Uh, we uh, we've consulted people outside of Canada. Uh, Mr. Mr. Perrin uh, has been of great help to us, uh, helping us to see you know what's been done in in the UK and in, in in Europe. So we've tried to, and we've obviously been talking with a number of governments around the world. Uh, just this morning, I was on uh, on a call with the the the, the, the German uh, culture minister, Mr. Gruters. Uh, we've spoken with the Australians, the French, um, so we, we've tried to, to, to gather as much input as possible uh, doing this to, to, to be able to, to learn from, from what others have, uh, have done and, 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 you know, what has worked well, what, has, what, what maybe hasn't worked so well. There, there aren't that many countries around the world that have tried to tackle this, but we have, we have some examples that, 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 we can that we can look at. So uh, I, I don't have, you know, I mean, over a hundred organizations were, 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 were consulted in, in Canada uh, to, 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 to prepare this legislation. And what were some of, what were some of those, those lessons that, that you're able to learn from other countries? You know, what, what did work well and what didn't work well? Uh, what have you learned as you were developing this? Um, well, I, I think some some of the lessons that 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 we've learned and certainly that i've learned is that um, so let's be clear this piece of legislation won't solve all of the problems uh, that we are seeing uh, with online platforms we're, we're tackling five important illegal activities uh it doesn't there are other issues and and we're, we're we realize that, but I think one of the lesson that that I've learned is that when starting to do this, you shouldn't try to tackle everything. Um, it, it's we are to some extent in uncharted territories in terms of legislation. I mean, we haven't done that in Canada. Few other countries around the world have have done it, but we are certainly amongst the the, the early adopters uh, of of that. So there, perhaps there are merits in in um, in putting forward a, a framework um, that that will be able to evolve over time. Um, technologies are, are changing rapidly in in the field. Social habits are, are changing rapidly in the field. So what we're trying to do is is to put forward a so a legal framework and ensuring regulations that that will be able to adapt to these changes o over time. That's certainly um, one of the one of the lessons that that, that we've learned. We, I, I think, I mean, in my mind, it's clear we need um, the the task of of regulating this this devel developing the regulation that the, the, springing from that from that bill um, would need to be we would need to task a new regulator to do that. Um, it, it's you know, it's so different than other types of regulations uh, or regulators that, that we have in Canada that I certainly feel that we need uh, a, a shop with specific expertise to, to do that. And certainly the example of the e-safety commissioner in, uh, in Australia is a, is a very good example of, of a system that is, that is working well, that is 
widely recognized as, uh, as, as one of the best out there. Uh, we've been working very closely with their office. They've been feeding us information. I, I had a conversation with the e-safety commissioner, uh, Julie Hinman, uh, to, to, to understand you know, the do's and don't uh, and, the, and the lessons that they've learned because they've been doing that for a few years now. So yeah, this is, um, these are the things that have, that have helped uh, guide us in, in, in developing this. And so this legislation, I know that uh, you have some limits on what you can tell us about it because obviously it hasn't been tabled yet. Uh, but my understanding is that from, from what we know about it, um, as you mentioned, it's going to, it's not going to expand what's illegal. It's going to deal with the categories of online harms that are already illegal. So that's hate speech, terrorist content, content that, that incites violence, child sexual exploitative content, and non-consensual sharing of intimate content. So those are the categories that are going to be covered by this. Uh, there's going to be a new aspect, uh, a, there's going to be a new aspect in that there will be a definition of hate speech that will be based on previous court decisions. Um, and that, but that's kind of the justice uh, piece of this. And then I wanted to ask you about the, the heritage side of, of this legislation. So you've already mentioned the regulator, um, it, that this legislation will create a new regulator to deal with, the, to deal with online um, hate. Can you tell us any more about how that regulator will work? Uh, what will it look like? What will its responsibility be? Well, uh, just to be clear, everything we're talking about regarding this legislation is is conditional because it you know it hasn't been tabled yet. Um, uh, so, but the way the way I, the way I see it, I I, I think we need a, a new regulator. I think this regulator um, needs to be able to. Um, to have audit powers over 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 what platforms are doing in terms of content moderation, have some understanding of how they are dealing with with these issues. What are the best practices out there? And and, and as we're we're looking, and I I, I have spoken with, with with many of the platforms uh, to 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 get a better sense of of how they're doing it. They have uh, in many cases different practices, some better than others, and and some clearly are showing better results. For, for the for the platforms, um, we want uh, we want transparency. Uh, there's absolutely no transparency whatsoever right now in terms of content moderation. Some platforms uh, have given us a um, better glimpse uh, at how they do it uh, than others, but but overall. Um, the, 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 the criteria are, are different from one platform to another, what, what gets taken down, why, how, when. Uh, we, we want transparency so that Canadians know how this is done. Um, and obviously, uh, if I refer you back to my, to, to my mandate letter, so the instructions gave me when I became Heritage Minister, uh, there, is, there is this notion of a 24-hour takedown. Um, uh, this is something that uh, we we would want we want we want to do in Canada. It's something that other countries are are, are starting to, to to look at it as well. Because obviously, one of the big difference between um, online harms and and what happens in the physical world. I mean, someone says something to you in the physical world. Well, they said it. You move on. It's it's behind you. Uh, when, once on the on on an online platform, when something is posted there, it can stay there for a very long time. It can get reproduced and shared and reshared um, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. Um, and, and it's very difficult for people to have individual citizens to have any control over it. So we want to shift the burden from people to the platform. We want the platform to be more responsible for this. And, and we want a Canadian regulator to ensure that that they are more responsible, um, we're looking at different elements uh, in terms of some form of uh, of appeal mechanism. Because um, one of the things we're seeing, and when you look at the literature, um, because these algorithms are, are trained to recognize keywords and not, and not so much the the context in which these words are, are being used, a lot of the a lot of the content that is being taken down right now is content that is being posted by equity seeking groups and, 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 and racialized people. Uh, why? Because they will use certain keywords that are recognized by, by the algorithms as being problematic, not realizing, I mean, the algorithms can't tell the difference between 
two black people talking about their, their daily reality and using certain words that they would use in an everyday conversation, not in a harmful way, and a white supremacist using the same words to, to, in a very violent way against a person or a community. Um, so we, we're, we're looking at the idea of putting in place a, an appeal mechanism when people feel that their content is unfairly being taken down by, by, by platforms. And, and right now, you have really no recourse to, 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 to deal with this. So this is uh, another thing we, uh, we're looking at. Obviously, the, um, the regulator would be able to impose um, hefty monetary penalties in case of noncompliance. Uh, certainly been looking at what uh, other countries are doing on that front. Europe certainly being, uh, being, being one of them. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's in a, in a nutshell, that's what we're, that's what we have in mind in a, in developing this, uh, this legislation. And I'm just trying to picture how, how this would work. So would the regulator decide, no, that's hate speech, you need to take it down and then the platforms would have 24 hours to react or would it be up to the platforms maybe acting on guidelines, I don't know, given fr from the regulator to make that first call and then the appeals would go to the regulator? From a, I mean, obviously the regulator will have to, to develop exactly how it will happen. As legislator, we, we, we don't tend to develop that, the, the how. We say what and, and what we hope, you know, we, we, we can tell the regulator this is what we're hoping in terms of, of result, but the regulator is tasked with, with developing the, the how. But in my mind, um, I think your, your, second, your second example is closer to the, th the truth. I mean, I, I think that the first thing that should be done is that these things should be flagged to the platforms. They have a lot of resources to deal with this much more than even a Canadian regulator would, would have. So the first thing that, that someone or an organization should do is most, most likely would be to flag it to the platform. And once it is flagged, then, uh, then the 24 hour takedown would, would, would start. Uh, if a platform decides not to take uh, not to take a publication down, uh, I imagine that I mean one of the possible scenarios would be that then a person or group can turn to the Canadian regulator and then the regulator the, the regulator kicks in. Uh, but but obviously as you as you mentioned as you rightly pointed out, uh, firstly you know the regulator would put in place a, a series of guidelines so that the, the, the platforms are the the first line uh, uh, of attack on that and they know exactly what what we're expecting expecting from them. It would be unfair to ask them to do something if it's not, if we're not clear in terms of, uh, of what we're asking from them. And this, uh, the 24-hour requirement, I know that um, various groups have flagged their concern with this, which is that if uh, platforms have 24 hours to take down content, and if they don't take down the content, they face fines, and you've said those fines will be material, they'll be substantial enough to, to incent the companies to act. Um, then the concern is that the platforms will act, will, over, will, will be overbroad in what they take down. And content that shouldn't be taken down is taken down. And then that's where we could see freedom of expression concerns and a potential constitutional challenge because we'll see content being taken down that doesn't fit the criteria. And I just wanted to hear your response to that or, or is this something you've taken into consideration in developing this? Of course it is. Um, and I mean, in my mind, and again, the regulator would, would, would define that with, with more precision, but we wouldn't go from content not taken down, uh, tech platform being fined. There, there's obviously, there, there, there is going to be a mechanism in, in between where if a platform decides not to take down something, they, we, we're looking there, new uh, me mechanism that we could put in place, um, uh, e-tribunal, for example, w which are not as, um, as heavy in terms of procedures as formal tribunals, where you need to show up with your lawyers and, 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 and everything. So lighter mechanism where, where the regulator could, could, look at, uh, could look at a case, and it would be easy for, for users as well. It'd be more user friendly, so so that there is due process before you get to to a fine. It wouldn't be you know we wouldn't be going from from zero to a hundred right away. Clearly, um, uh, that's number one. Number two, I, I think this idea that I that I've expressed a little bit earlier on about an, an appeal mechanism, so that people who feel that their content has been taken down uh, unfairly would would have would, would have an appeal mechanism. Uh, embedded in, 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 into the system. That's also something we, we are looking at. 
um, to try and and ensure that 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 there is due process in 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 in, in the system. And um, what's the timeline for this? You know, how long do you see taking to create this brand new regulator and then have it um, actually start to work? That's a good question. I mean. Uh, this is this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow morning. First, the legislation has to be tabled. Uh, that needs to be debated in the House. We are a minority government. It's a bit more tricky to 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 move legislation in the House these days. Um, but I'm confident that we can get this uh, adopted. Once the legislation is adopted, clearly, uh, you know, creating a a new body, a, a new regulator like that in Canada would would take some time. I don't have an exact uh, time frame to, to 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 offer you today, but but it it would take it, it it would take some time, and you can look at how other countries have have done it and get a sense of how much time it can take to 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 build something to to build something like that. And is there any more detail you can provide us about the new regulator in terms of you know how it will function, what kinds of you know people or experts might sit on it, uh, what kinds of powers it might have, um, anything else you're, you're able to tell us about that? Um, I, 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 you know, I think uh, I would argue that one of the model that has influenced this the most is is the Australian uh, e-safety commissioner, and and we're. Um, Australia and Canada are are are, are similar in, in many ways. Certainly, you know, Commonwealth countries, similar institutions, uh, similar type of uh, of of bodies and 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 laws, um, institution jurisprudence, and um, their their system seems to be working well. Um, so. Could, we're we're looking at different aspect of of the system that they've put in place, and whether or not these are things that we would want to see in our own legislation and eventually in a in a in a regulatory system in in Canada. Um, the the Australian system has the ability to uh, the e safety commissioner in Australia has the ability to come into uh, agreements uh, with different types of organization, crown crown, crown corporation, uh, law enforcement, but also NGOs uh, in some cases to, to 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 better develop certain expertise in in certain areas. This is interesting because, as I said earlier, we we know this is a field where both technologies and and habits are changing rapidly and will likely continue to change rapidly over time. So we need to we need to create a, a regulatory system that can evolve and and not something that's set in stone and 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 won't be able to to evolve over the next twenty years. That would be a a big mistake. And 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 Australia has certainly shown. Uh, that that it has developed, that that has evolved over time. There's been a number of of, um, of changes that that, that they've made uh, over the years, adding new uh, illegal activities that they're tackling or issues that they're tackling. So that's certainly what what I have in mind: a, a system that can evolve over time. And I, I do want to go to the audience question, but I did just want to clarify one thing and ask you um, about it. So you've said this this legislation, obviously, it's not going to tackle disinformation, which is obviously a big online harm that has been getting a lot of attention. Um, and, you know, we've all learned what harms it can cause. So uh, why won't uh, misinformation be tackled in this bill? And um, what do you think governments should be doing to, to deal with that issue? Um, I think it would be very difficult and and from a democratic point of view problematic for government to start saying this is good information this is bad information um, i some governments are doing it, doing it around the world i i don't think this is something we would want to see in canada um, however it, it's not because we can't legislate on on this that we that we we should remain passive about it so we are doing uh, doing a number of things i mean one of the things we we want to do is to ensure that we have a health a healthy media sector and 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 therefore ensuring that we are tackling this this issue of fair remuneration for for media by online platforms namely namely google google and facebook 
Uh, since 2019, we've had this initiative at Canadian Heritage called the D Digital Citizen Initiative, where we're funding um, different kinds of organization, think, think tanks, um, uh, NGOs, um, uh, academic uh, groups uh, are, are around the country um, to, 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 to help create a generation of more enlightened uh, Canadians when it comes to being online, develop be better reflexes, uh, having people better equipped to recognize fake news, to, to, to look, to, to, to ensure that, the, 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 that they look at the sources when, when they see something and, and, and just don't take it for cash. Um, and, and this is something we, we want to expand going into the future. This is certainly something I, I, I want to, to do more. Uh, we're funding uh, Ryerson University. There's a, a research group in Concordia dealing with, um, with online harms, uh, especially re in regards to women. In, uh, and uh, we know women in politics, women journalists, um, they, they tend to be much more uh, the, the, the target of, uh, of attacks on, uh, online. So... So this is what we're doing. We're, we're, we're not staying passive, but I, 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 simp I think it would be just too risky for, 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 for governments to, to, to try and regulate this. And uh, so from the audience, uh, the question is, can you speak to the role of social media platforms in regulating harmful content versus the role of the Canadian government? So has the responsibility or the role of social media platforms evolved and do these platforms recognize their responsibility on this issue? Um, so basically what we've done for about a decade, and when I say we, most governments, the vast majority of governments are, uh, around, around the planet, with, with a few exceptions, is we've let these companies uh, self-regulate uh, with the results that we have today. I mean, as an environmentalist, I, no one was ever able to make me a, a convincing demonstration that, that self-regulation in the environmental sector works. I've, I've never seen anything to support that. I don't think self-regulation when it comes to online harms work either. Um, I, I, I think we can, we can put in place a, 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 a regulatory framework that will, uh, that will force tech companies to, to be more responsible. Um, so I'm not saying the government has to do anything. I, I, as I was explaining earlier, I, I, it, in, in the system that, that, that we're imagining for, 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 for Canada, these platforms have an important role to play, um, but it won't be, it, it, it's going to be regulated. Uh, it, it, it won't be left to the platform to decide how they do it, what, what they take down, what they, what they leave. Uh, so those notions of, of, of transparency and accountability uh, will be at the core of, uh, uh, of this bill that, 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 that will be tabled in, in, in the coming weeks to ensure that, they're, uh, that on the one hand, they're more responsible when it comes to content moderation. And, and then when they fail to do that, that we have mechanisms in place to deal with, with, with these issues. I, I suspect that, you know, the more responsible they get, the less the, the regulator and Canadians and Canadian organizations will have to deal with problematic issues. But, but we still need to have processes in place for when that happens. And a, a more specific question, um, with regard to the online harms legislation, is the government of Canada considering using tools like upload filters, I guess, to target harmful content online, so just using filters to, to block the content from getting uh, put up in the first place? This is indeed a very technical question, um, and not having tabled the, the, the and you understand that, uh, I mean, you're, we're, we're really entering into the mechanics of how this work, and I'm, for people less familiar with the legislative process, like when we, when we the legislator table a bill, we 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 tend to to, to put in place a framework for, for 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 these issues, and then we mandate a regulator, like I did for for the the, the cultural aspect uh, of this debate with, with Bill C10. We have we have this legislative framework, and then we're mand we're we're giving a mandate to our regulator to develop exactly the 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 the, the nitty gritty of how it's going to be done. Um, so I, I can't really answer y your question. I, I and, and, and in fact, you know, there will be public consultations for the elaboration of the regulation. So 
people will be able to, to, to make those proposals to the regulator. And then it's going to be up to the regulator to look at, okay, well, what, what are the best tools that I have to, 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 to apply this new regulation in Canada? I think just looking at that question, I think, and I could be wrong here, I think the idea was just to ask whether the government is considering blocking content before it's, before it's put up, as opposed to taking down content that's harmful that's already been put up, if that's something you're considering. But I appreciate if you can't answer that. Um, could we, uh, <clears throat> could we, uh, could we envision having blocking orders? I mean, that's, that, it, maybe, um, it's not, uh, you know, it's a, it, it would be, it would likely be a, a last result, last result, uh, nuclear bomb in, in a, in a toolbox of, uh, uh of mechanism for for regulator, I, I suspect that if we were to do this, you know, it, it wouldn't be something the regulator would 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 be able to 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 use at will. Um, uh, one would imagine that before before using a, such a measure, the, the regulator might have to um, you know go back to the government council or or something. That's a pretty extreme, but it's not. I mean, it, theoretically, it is it is a tool that is that is out there and that could potentially be used. But 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 really, no decisions uh, have been made on, on on that. And I would imagine, you know, this is something you would see uh, as part of the regulation, most likely. And um, here's one from Terence Hamilton. Uh, this legislation has tremendous implications for children and young people under 18. Can you tell us a bit about how this legislation will prioritize the rights of children and the ways they use the internet? How will you ensure the complaint mechanism is child friendly? Well, we've been working with a number of organizations that that are representing uh, children's right and, and and that are dealing with uh, with, with with child having. Uh, problems with, with uh, online arms. Um, I mean, this is clearly one of the categories uh, uh, that, 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 that this legislation is targeting. Uh, targeting. As a father of, of four and, and stepfather to two, I, I see my kids on, on these platforms uh, all the time. And, and you know, mostly um, it is an enjoyable uh, experience for, for them, but, but we, we see, unfortunately, um, uh, issues uh, arising, uh, harmful, uh, harmful issues. So, so I'm. How are we doing? Well, we're looking at the best examples that, in terms of legislation, that are around the, that, that, that that exist around the world to, to deal with this. And and we've been working closely with with organizations that have developed expertise over the years to try and ensure that that this legislation will, as you rightly point out, uh, protect uh, protect our kids. And a question from Brian Herman. Uh, will the government encourage enhanced industry support for, quote, counter speech initiatives, including fostering, aggregating, and promoting positive messages responding to offensive content? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, I was talking earlier about the, the digital citizen initiative that, that, that we've launched in, in 2019. And I think this is, this is part of what we're trying to do with that, um, to, 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 to help organizations uh, that, 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 that are very familiar with, with, with these issues um, paint a different picture of, of, of what is, uh, is portrayed by some. Uh, and, and earlier I, I talked about a minority, um, but, 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 by, but this, this, this violent minority that, that is attacking equity-seeking groups and, and, and women and, and racialized Canadians. Um, so this initiative is, is certainly one that, that, that we're tackling. Um, I mean, the, the, the federal government is doing a, a number of things uh, around issues of, of uh, diversity and, and inclusion. We have a secretariat now within, within Canadian Heritage. We're f funding initiatives throughout the country uh, on, on these issues. Um, in, in Bill C-10, um, one of the things we, 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 we want to tackle with, with Bill C-10 is that uh, we diverse voices are have more of an access to our broadcasting system have more resources so that they can tell their 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 stories themselves um so racialized canadians um I indigenous peoples so that there are various mechanisms we're we're using in, in in canada to try and ensure that those that there's a positive um 
uh, image of, of diversity that, that, that is being shown on uh, an online platform and, and in society in general. And I think we have time for maybe one quick uh, question uh, that's left. So this is from Rob Davidson. Canada does, does not have a thriving, robust fact-checking infrastructure for all media. Are there plans to provide incentives and or programs to support independent fact-checking? Um, well, I, I was talking about the, the, the role of media. I, I think when we look uh, around the world, it's not just media that tend to do that, but largely uh, media outlets that, that, that have been doing that. So by ensuring that we have a healthy media sector, uh, I, I, I think that um, this, this is one of the ways, perhaps not the only way, but certainly one of the, the ways that, that we ensure that there is fact-checking happening. Uh, a number of newspapers or media outlet, uh, certainly the, the CBC, but others uh, are doing that um, and, uh, and are doing it well. We just have to, uh, as a government, we just have to ensure that they have the resources that they need to, to do that and continue thriving. Well, I think that uh, with that, we're out of time. So thank you so much, Minister Gibo, uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Anya. So um, here with us today, we have Laura Tribe. Laura is the Executive Director for Open Media. It's an advocacy group that works to keep the internet open, affordable, and surveillance-free. Laura leads Open Media's campaigns and advocacy on digital privacy and has a background in the intersection of human rights and information communication technologies. Laura holds a BA in Media, Information, and Technoculture from Western, and an MA in Communications from Carleton University. And then we have Vivek Krishnamurthy. Um, he is a professor of law and director of the Samuel Glushko Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, that's CIPIC, um, at the University of Ottawa. And his teaching, scholarship, and clinical legal practice focus on the regulatory and human rights related challenges that arise in cyberspace. He advises governments, activists, and companies on human rights impacts of new technologies. He's currently a fellow um, at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and a senior associate of the Human Rights Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. And finally, we also have Will Perrin. Uh, Will is a trustee of the Carnegie UK Trust, where with Professor Lorna Woods, he led work on the regulation of online harms since 2018. The Woods pair and model of risk management seemed to form the basis of the UK government internet safety proposals. Uh, he spent 15 years in the civil service and was first asked to look at internet regulation in 1994. Um, he worked as a policy advisor to the prime minister from 2001 to 2004, which concluded communication regulation. Uh, and he ran a social tech media business for 10 years after leaving the civil service and was asked by the Secretary of State to advise on the future of local TV news. Uh, so these are um, our panelists. And to start off with, um, I, I just want to get your, your first impressions of what we just heard from Minister Debo. Uh, so maybe Laura, we'll, we'll start off with you. Uh, sure. I mean, I think there was a lot in there for the minister. And I think... Uh, a lot of talk around uh, issues that maybe go beyond online harms, talking about uh, news and you'll see time and broadcast. And I think there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think speaking specifically around online harms, uh, I, I was hoping for a little bit more concrete answers from the minister on what's actually in this legislation. And I think one of the things that has been so difficult in talking about these issues is that we're talking about a very theoretical bill. And I think one of the things that uh, to be honest, was a little frustrating in, in the minister's remarks is all of this talk about consultations and transparency when as one of the largest advocacy groups in the country working on these issues, we've never been consulted. Our community of hundreds of thousands of people has never been asked to weigh in on this issue and demanding transparency from the companies on these issues while having a completely opaque process yourself feels pretty hypocritical. And so I think it's, it's really frustrating that we keep talking about this issue when more issues keep being put on the table in different proposals and we still don't have anything really concrete to know what exactly are we talking about right now. And uh, Vivek, what about you? What was, what was your takeaway? Um, so I think there's a lot of good intentions um, behind this proposal, right? So, I, I, you know, the government clearly and, and minister um, are concerned about the online environment and the harms that accrue to many individuals online. Um, I share Laura's concerns around the process. Um, I don't think the government has been nearly as transparent or consultative in developing this. And frankly, 
um, I'm a little concerned um, that the approach seems to be replicating other governments rather than um, trying to strike out new ground. And it's clear to me and to people who study this seriously that existing approaches have not worked. So if we're gonna do something to tackle uh, this set of problems, it needs to be different and we can have that discussion, right? So it's a process problem. Um, I'm also concerned about the substance, uh, both for the replication, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, depending where the legislation lands, um, a lot of vague ideas here of uh, ill-defined powers that could be difficult from a human rights perspective and from a constitutional perspective. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. And Will, um, what are your thoughts? Uh, I have a, a lot of sympathy for a government minister who's engaged in consultation with that many government departments in setting up a piece of policy. There was a, a long list he rattled off at the beginning. It makes it extremely hard to speak openly when uh, you're in those kinds of internal bureaucratic arrangements is what I, I used to do a long time ago, and I'm so glad I, I'm not doing them now. Um, and I think it is valid, though, to consult widely around the world. Um, if you look at the G UK presidency of the G7 at the moment, there's a substantial thread uh, reporting to a G7 meeting of tech ministers, which will take place shortly, about online safety, because we see uh, Canada very in, in the leading pack of forming rules in, in this space. The UK is maybe slightly ahead with, with some rules. The whole of the EU with the Digital Services Act proposals. Australia published new proposals in, I think it was January this year. We see, um, and of course, we must look much more broadly than uh, the typical G7 group. We see India as well with a comprehensive set of proposals I've not had a chance to study yet. Uh, and of course, even in the G7, there's still Japan doing some work as well. And there's a big grouping uh, around the, the Chinese governments that align around China uh, as they're developing rules as well uh, outside a tr more traditional democratic framework. So um, uh, I think he, he revealed a, a few interesting bits there, dangling the possibility of a new regulator, um, of some sort of uh, rapid judicial process, uh, which reflects, as I understand it, Canadian constitutional norms, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but uh, around the world, people are grappling with these issues. And I, but the legislation, I agree with everybody, only gets better if you consult on it, um, even though that slows the progress and doesn't respond uh, immediately to the acute political pressure many politicians feel under at the moment to, to legislate in this area. So in the UK, we expect in mid-June to have a full uh, consultative bill being, being published, a draft bill being laid before Parliament for Parliament to debate in draft before it's reintroduced as legislation or reflecting that process and that's good governance um, and of course for all of us engaged in this exercise ar around the world the the issue of course is the USA what is the Biden administration going to do in this space you know Biden himself was very strident uh, about the need to do something around section 230 in spring last year um, uh, Vice President Harris when she was Attorney General in California was deeply involved in a section 230 court case so it's but it's fascinating to see what will arise from the American administration because after all we're mainly talking about regulating American companies and Chinese companies in in this space mainly for the impact they if you parrot if you if you um, uh, portray them as, as, as let's say, you use a theoretical model as polluting companies for the pollution that they cause that falls upon other countries, which has been dealt with in other industries over the last 50 or 60 years, but is new in this space. So lots of fascinating tensions there. And uh, what about, obviously, uh, we don't know the details um, about what this regulator will look like, what this new mechanism will look like, um, but in terms of what we did hear about how it can function and uh, the responsibilities it could have, um, any, any of your initial thoughts on, on that as a model of, of what we just heard? I feel free to jump in just then. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump in first on that one, and I think there's probably lots of discussion on that one as well. I think there are two things that really stand out um, in what we heard about that. The first was actually what we didn't hear. And in the entire conversation, there was not a single mention of the users who are putting illegal content online. All of this talk is around the platforms, but no matter how much you try and take that content down, even if you try and hold the platforms accountable, it doesn't get at the fact there is a person behind that putting that content online. And unless there is any responsibility or recourse or accountability for the users that are posting that content, they're just gonna go somewhere else. It's not gonna discourage that behavior and it's not gonna get at those underlying issues of hate that are online that we are trying to deal with. And I think that's a real question mark around how that fits into this regulator model. Um, I think the second thing that was a, uh, 
a little unclear in what the minister said, but raises a lot of questions is what that appeals mechanism looks like. Uh, and, you know, we, we talk about and heard him talk about how it's only looking at illegal content. And so do we now have platforms or a regulator being a court, basically deciding what is or is not a legal body? Uh, but more specifically, if content is taken down because a company determines it's something they don't want on their platform, but it is technically not illegal, are companies now required to put that content back up? What does that do for content that is in that awful but lawful category that might actually not be something that that company wants to carry, but is not technically illegal? Are companies now obligated to carry that content, which does the exact opposite of what I think the minister started by saying, which is the intention of trying to make the internet more welcoming to communities who often feel silenced online. And so I think there's a lot of questions there around how those two pieces will be navigated. I think on uh, regulators, um, around the world, different approaches are being taken. And forgive me, uh, I will probably, this is probably the perspective I'll, I'll take in this, in this discussion, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, so in Ireland, uh, they have uh, some advanced laws on regulating online videos, which could be applicable to wider internet content, and they're creating a new regulator. They're saying their existing broadcasting regulator needs a full overhaul and a replacement. Um, at the EU level, um, uh, the, because of the problems that arose under the GDPR, with ironically, of course, the Irish regulator not being fit for purpose to regulate the big tech companies, they're, they're proposing that the Commission itself adopts a new high-level regulatory role over the biggest companies. So a very big new regulator there, and probably in member states, um, uh, uh, the broadcasts or telco regulator taking on the role. Um, in Australia, they're sticking with the safety commissioner in their model, which your minister is clearly very, very taken with. And in the UK, um, we, we as will stick with Ofcom, the, the extremely experienced broadcast telecoms regulator, uh, who are at the moment recruiting staff in huge numbers to take on this, this new function. And it's a judgment call really as to whether in any territory that's going to regulate this, whether their existing regulator is fit for purpose or whether it's time for an overhaul. Because when you overhaul and create a new regulator, you have substantial innovation risk in that you can't be certain that the new regulator will be able to stand up to the massive legal forces that will be deployed against it from the world's biggest companies with enormous cash mountains. So you have to be very careful in how you construct that new body. But it may be that that's the right judgment in, 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 in Canada as clearly in, as they thought in Ireland and, uh, and in the EU. Um, yeah, I would I'd like want... to jump in here. Uh, sorry, Will, go ahead. No, no, uh, after you. Um, so, I mean, I echo lo a lot of Laura's concerns about the regulator, but I want to build on something Will said here, which is that we do see this proliferation of national regulators. And I think there's a fundamental problem with that. We're talking about regulating a global internet, right? One of the great things that's developed over the last 25 years is a global borderless internet where people can communicate seamlessly around the world. And there's always been this tension between the global nature of the internet, um, uh, the free movement of information across national borders, and the fact that the, the world is divided into countries that try to assert regulatory authorities over this amorphous phenomenon. Now, so there's a bit of a mismatch happening, right? And one of the concerns in the internet policy community um, is that this is going to push forward fragmentation. So we have a bunch of different co countries that are trying to enforce their national laws online, uh, against global platforms. We're not going to have that global experience anymore. Now, maybe it's not so concerning in Canada and in Australia and in countries that have strong commitments to democracy, rule of law, and human rights. But, you know, just recently, um, Pakistan has passed legislation that applies its laws quite aggressively to online content. Poland and Hungary are considering it. There are new rules in India, which is a country that is really sliding towards autocracy very quickly. Um, that impose pretty draconian restrictions um, on online uh, expression and also, um, you know, there's other things in, in, in that set of IT rules as well. So, you know, I think we need to be concerned about the approach that we're taking. And for a government that talks a lot about multilateralism, international cooperation, um, why are we doing this domestically? We could do this multilaterally, right? We could get together yeah. with other democratic governments and come up with a supranational set of guidelines to govern uh, online content providers. And one of the advantages of doing that on an international basis is that we're going to run straight into huge problems of jurisdiction. So Facebook, Google, Twitter, you know, they have significant presences in Canada. If they don't follow the new rules that we 
uh, Institute, you know, we can bring them to court, we can find them, sure. Of course, they already have pretty good rules on illegal content. But what do we do with the gabs of the world? The parlors, the new Trump social network, if he's going to launch one, right? These are beyond our reach. And that, those are precisely the places, it's those darkest corners of the internet, where we see the worst content, the stuff that's illegal under our laws, proliferating. And that's the place where you know, uh, all of these terrible things are being incubated, right? So there's a mismatch here in two ways, right? One is the sort of geography of the internet, but the other is just sort of getting to where is the real problem with the worst content? And it's not on the mainstream platforms anymore. So I, I think though you're exactly right, uh, Vivek, I mean, that's, that's spot on. Um, we are completely lacking an international, uh, not completely, but we're fairly lacking an international treaty base um, amongst democracies on which to base um, transnational regulation. However, one cannot say that just because a global internet exists, um, sovereign states should not be able to make their own rules about it. Um, because that's an argument that international mining companies would make to say that there is ore all over the world. Um, and you can't make your own rules about how it's extracted because it's ore. you just can't regulate how it's extracted. So there is a balance in there. And if one only has to have a cursory look at, at the media to see that you know, Mr. Guilbo has been uh, not flying, but has been zooming all over the world. Um, he's met with his Australian counterpart. He's met with Scandinavian counterparts. He's met with his British counterpart. Um, but what where everyone is um, gingerly trying to find their way towards, if I can be very frank about it, I think, is a process that the United States Biden administration is willing to take part in because there's no sign yet of because the Biden administration is so new they've only just made their appointments and they're very different from the Trump administration of course as to what their demeanor will be towards their big companies which are being regulated around the world will they fall back into the traditional American trade position of saying don't be mean to our big companies you know at the moment they're they're announcing retaliatory tariffs on the US on the UK and France it'll be cheese and whiskey I think um, for um, the temerity having the temerity to digitally tax um, these these big some of the big American companies but in that case the Americans can say there is a multilateral process with the OECD that you should be taking part in don't move bilaterally but at the moment there isn't a multilateral process that anyone can easily slot into on internet safety issues now the UK is trying to do that through its G7 presidency um, but uh, von der Leyen in the EU has made bilateral entreaties to the USA to say let's do an EU USA process that decides a common digital rule book and that leaves out Canada and that leaves out the UK I mean I'd rather we were in the EU but we're out of it now it leaves out Australia it leaves out Japan it leaves out all sorts of people so I think there's a lot of fumbling going on as we try and work that out but it'll become clearer um, when everyone knows where the Americans are on this but you're quite right a multilateral process would do this better a multilateral process amongst democracies and there's a very good piece by uh, Jared Cohen in, in foreign affairs recently where he talked about it as a T12 or a T14 of technically advanced nations to balance the Chinese initiative um, which picks up all the countries in their orbit in the digital silk road um, but because it was Jared Cohen he, he was from Google so he wasn't talking about regulation as being something they should talk about he was saying we should be doing on robots or something I can't remember um, but there's definitely space there definitely space and I think Mr. Guibo is trying What, what do we know about uh, where the Biden administration is on this? Because I'm thinking specifically about the efforts to implement a corporate tax on the biggest, uh, you know, on the biggest global digital companies for digital services. And there was a process at the OECD that kind of stalled for a while while Trump was in power that now it seems to be getting back on track. Looks like we're going to have that, uh, you know, that consensus reached by, uh, by mid, you know, mid 2021 of this year. Um, but beyond that, do we know how the Biden administration might differ from where Trump was on some of these issues? So um, uh, Attorney General Barr, working for President Trump, uh, published a set of proposals for Section 230 reform, which um, reflected a, a right of center position in the USA uh, that said a platform should not be able to turn down right wing voices. Um, and Mr. President, now President Biden said in his lunch with the, I think it was the New York Times editorial board around this time last year, he was very strident on Facebook and Section 230, very strident. And then if you look at attorney, uh, former Attorney General of California, uh, Vice President Harris's remarks around the, the Backpage case, 
which is another Section 230 case. There's clearly something there. And in Biden's campaign proposals, he said that he would launch a task force to investigate and, and reduce um, online violence and harassment towards women and girls. That was a hard commitment. Um, and of course, the FTC made some symbolic appointments at the FTC to see if this problem can be tackled via traditional ec economic means. But we are still waiting for an annunciation and indeed possibly for appointments of the right people, as far as I know anyway, of, of a Biden uh, approach to this. But it's hard to see, I, I would think, an approach similar to previous American administrations where they've just relentlessly exported Section 230 and trade deals. And I'm not entirely sure that would be the starting point, but I'm only guessing, I'm afraid. Yeah, just to pick up on the Section 230 point. So Section 230 is a um, provision of the Communications Act of 1996 in the United States, which basically says that a online platform is not responsible for the harms caused by content that are posted by the users. So if you say something defamatory on Twitter um, or you post uh, you know, uh, something that is incitement to violence on Facebook, uh, you're responsible, not the platform. Um, but it provides an immunity shield that lets the platform moderate that <coughs> down without any liability on its side. That's called the Good Samaritan provision. Um, so there's a lot of controversy in the United States about Section 230 from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, it's not clear if it's going to survive and it probably won't survive in its current form. Uh, what's most likely to happen is that it'll be conditioned in some way. So let's, assume, let's make that the starting point, right? That the, the legal regime of the United States changes. So it's not a blanket immunity for platforms, but it's conditioned on something. And that's actually similar to what's in our trade agreement with the US. Uh, under the uh, USMCA, um, there's kind of a watered down version of Section 230, which is Article 19.17. So what does that do in this uh, debate that we're having? Well, not really that much. One of the fundamental problems that I think we're, we're having in this discussion here is that um, what governments can regulate consistent with international human rights norms and their domestic constitutions is small, right? The standard for making content illegal in any rights respecting democracy is really high. Um, that's because we value free expression, right? And this is the lawful but awful point that Laura made. Um, so, you know, for better or for worse, um, we have to rely on platforms um, those private intermediaries to make a lot of calls, right? All of, the, all of the sort of mainstream platforms have rules that are up here. If the law is down here, you know, what you can say on any mainstream platform, at least as a matter of the rule book, is much more restrictive, right? Um, so let's take some racial, you know, race, racially offensive uh, comments, right? That was something the minister mentioned. Um, you know, a lot of that's perfectly legal. Right, it is racial insults for better or for worse are legal in most countries, right? But they're illegal or they're not permitted by um, many of the platforms, right? So if we really value online safety and we want to create that you know very positive online environment, for better or for worse, we're going to have to work with private organizations to come up with private rules that are going to you know create that safety, make those investments. So the question is. What are the tools and levers that a government has to incentivize that, that conduct? And in my view, it's not going to be, uh, you know, this sort of model where, you know, it, remove it within 24 hours because it's illegal or you pay fines. Like, it's not going to work. We need a different kind of approach. And, um, you know, I'm just looking at this from, from an international perspective, and it kind of seems like, like, from what I'm hearing some of you say that, you know, it's, it's challenging um, to have Canada move on its own when we're talking about the internet, we're talking about global companies, we're talking about platforms that may not be as present in Canada as you know, Facebook or, or whoever is. And then there's also the challenge of even if all of the democratic countries sit down together and come up with a, a common approach to this and they all implement it, well, that's not the entire world. Right. There are other countries that have a different perspective that will, um, you know, that might implement similar rules to their own means. Right. So is this, I mean, is this entire approach to trying to regulate online harms, is this even possible? Like, is this a losing game? Uh, I, the analogy I often make is is the long term uh, approaches to regulating financial markets, um, the so-called Basel Accords. 
uh, where over 20 years, um, the countries with the most sophisticated financial markets uh, and their, regula their regulators have come together to develop a rule set uh, to try and manage risk and produce put a range of issues into the governance of global financial companies. Of course, CAE doesn't work perfectly, as we've seen with any number of crashes where regulation has gone wrong, but that's been a long-term process of intense work between regulators of the most sophisticated markets. And in that process, people, uh, regulators from other markets observe or take part a, a, as they can, as they have the capability to do it. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, and I also, the other thing, social media networks, you know, every single pixel you see on a screen when you use a social network is there as a result of a decision taken by the company that runs that network. A decision about uh, its terms of service when you sign up, a decision about its software, a decision about the resources it puts into maintaining and enforcing those terms of service and, and the software. It's the old Larry Lessig thing, code is law. So um, I never personally think philosophically that big companies should be able to skip responsibility for the harms the operation of their service cause. And within that, of course, there are lots of issues around individual responsibility and so on, as, as Laura and others rightly picked up. Um, but these are big, well-resourced companies, the largest ones, uh, with substantial surpluses. Google Alphabet sitting on $120 billion of cash, Facebook $60 billion of cash, uh, Twitter less cash. Um, but it ought to be affordable for them to take reasonable steps to prevent reasonably foreseeable harms. And in the UK, the approach we've We've, we, we advanced first at Carnegie UK Trust and was then broadly roughly picked up by the UK government and then in a slightly different form by the, Euro, by the European Union uh, has been the, the, the way to approach that, to tackle this enormous problem, is to regulate the systems that the companies run rather than the individual items of, of individual things people say within it. So how can you make the systems safer and then produce an overall safer environment? Um, but on an 80-20 basis, you can never make it a, a totally 100% safe. That shouldn't be the aspiration. And of course, we have a model in a simpler form of technology that is still enormously powerful of a regulator, in many countries anyway, of a regulator acting with a big company in broadcasting. So in, in diff, many of the developed democracies around the world and others, the uh, parliament sets broad rules, which a regulator interprets and then explains to the companies and they take, they behave in a particular way as they produce their output, reflecting the regulatory ambit with some dist safe distance from uh, a government regulator. So uh, it, whilst social media of course, is very different, that principle is there of, of a model of regulation where parliament sets rules, uh, a regulator in, in, in manages them and companies then take decisions as to how they act within a, within a broad framework and you can dial that up or down as much as you want and that depends on um, uh, your national settlement um, in the territory in which you're looking to regulate um, and uh, the nature of the problem but a, a risk-based proportionate approach to, to regulation focusing on the highest risk most harmful outcome uh, issues first could be a solution. But the other issue I suppose, is we don't know yet. We're all still developing these rule sets, which no matter how much we consult upon them, we can't really know how they're going to work until they start working. Um, and so there is a great challenge. It's one of the, the most fascinating regulatory um, or public policy issues around at the moment, I think. Uh, I mean, you asked Anya, basically, is this a losing game? Like, is it even worth the effort? And I think when you look at how prolific the internet is in our lives, there's no getting around the fact that it has a pretty big impact. We have to look at what that is and how we create the internet that we want. I think um, one of the concerns that I have and the way that legislation is being discussed in Canada in particular is that it, it feels like uh, kind of using a machete instead of a scalpel. And I think this is something that needs to be done really carefully and really precisely because the ripple effects of this can be huge. And I think one of the things that is being missed in this conversation is who are the players in this space? So much of the talk is around Facebook and Google, and this is for the minister's work, not just on online harms, but looking at broadcasting, looking at news. All of it is focused on basically two companies and all of the regulations are being designed with the assumption that it will only be those two companies, which is almost foreclosing on the option of other companies entering the space. When you look at regulations that you have to be the size of Google or Facebook to comply with, you now can only have Google and Facebook in the ecosystem. And I think so many of the problems that we have right now with online content, with the ability to express ourselves freely is not feeling like we have the right spaces 
to do that, that we are limited in our options. And if we don't make it possible for new entrants to come in, for us to have new platforms and different types of platforms, then we really are going to be stuck with essentially one, two, three platforms where we're going to be have to watching quite closely because we won't have alternatives. And I think that's something that as we move forward with those regulations, we need to be really cautious around what we are tying ourselves to, to make sure that at the end of the day, we're working towards that version of the internet that we want, even if, yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's not easy to just wade into a comment section anywhere and say legal, illegal, harmful, not harmful, hateful, not hateful. It's difficult. It's not going to be perfect for sure. And that's, that's a given right out of the gate. But I think given how dramatic the ripple effects of getting it wrong are, it needs to be tackled really slowly and really carefully to make sure that we don't do more damage than good. Um, if I could uh, build on what Will said and what Laura said. So Will mentioned the European sort of architectural approach, right? Um, uh, governing how companies operate the inside. This is something we see the privacy sphere in the European Union with the GDPR, is that it's not just about the actual privacy rights, it's about how companies work inside. And what Laura said about diversity of platforms and this sort of, you know, focus on, on big companies, or something we can pull together from this that also ties to the uh, impending uh, uh, legislative effort on news content compensation, right? Um, and I think the, the point is that, um, um, you know, we might be looking at the wrong thing to regulate. Um, so we're talking about regulating content, we're talking about prompt takedown. We're not talking about the business model of the large companies, right? Which is precisely what's causing a lot of these problems, right? Um, why are we not considering, for example, uh, changing the way that platforms, you know, algorithmically promote certain stories, right? The engagement model, which is also driven by advertising. And there's a bit of an irony here, right? So the news compensation idea, it's that, okay, these companies have eaten the digital advertising lunch of conventional media. So let's take that money that they're generating and use it to subsidize news production. And, you know, I'm all for media diversity and supporting high quality news. But in order to do that, you have to reinforce the algorithmic curation model that makes us sit there, prioritizes um, content that's emotionally engaging, i.e. the stuff that's harmful, hateful, borderline, malinformation, disinformation, right? So there's a deep irony in that agenda, right? So if, you, if, if the government really thinking hard about structural change, we should be thinking about regulating those business models. And in some ways, that's a lot easier to do constitutionally. It doesn't raise the free expression challenges. It's probably, as Will will tell us, really hard from a trade law perspective uh, because we're getting into our you know, digital services agreements uh, under the USMCA, et cetera. Um, but in my mind, that's a better conversation to have and actually a better organizing theme for this conversation amongst democratic countries, right? Which asks some fundamental questions about the dominance of large companies, how they got there, and how it is that they're so damn profitable. Yeah, I, I agree. And you can see the beginnings of that. And I suppose I've got a question for where it's at in Canada in that the 2019, um, uh, I think it was the French presidency of the G7, maybe, I'm not sure, um, OECD competition ministries um, around the world signed a concordat to share information uh, on digital markets. Yes. And you can see that this has borne fruit. Um, and if you, because media competition regulators around the world are basically giving interviews saying how they talk to each other a lot about these big American and some Chinese, but mainly American uh, companies. And in the EU, the architecture that, that Vivek was referring to is that there is a Digital Services Act, which is about um, the social, broadly about the thing we're talking about today, roughly. And there's also a Digital Markets Act, which goes alongside it as pair to look at the economic issues that arise from this. And in the USA, it's, it, just, it seems likely that the FTC, the economic track, will proceed much faster than any, any, any track that looks at reform of 230 in, 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 le in legislation. So they're advancing on that track. And so I suppose, my, and in the UK, the, we, we've, uh, the regulators have all got together, the, the data regulator, the competition regulator, and Ofcom, the to be online services regulator, to form a, a digital markets, uh, I think it's a task force. They've even got a work plan, and they've made a set of asks to the government for new powers they need to make what are known as ex ante rules to govern the behavior of these big companies. 
Um, and I suppose my question is, where is that economic tracking in Canada? Because I'm not across that bit, because, but it's a logical thing to trigger. And it doesn't necessarily trigger, I don't know if it triggers um, USMCA issues, but competition law is one of those things around the world where there are, as far as I know, there aren't huge global treaties on it. Um, trade blocks tend to do it themselves. So I suppose that is a question there. Is, is that work being developed in Canada or, or not? I am afraid I can't answer that question for you as to how far it's come. So <laughs> it's a great question, but I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I have one. I don't know if Vivek, you have an answer on that one. Yeah, my, my um, understanding of it is that it's not nearly as advanced here as it is in um, our sort of peer countries, right? That the competition uh, agenda here, I mean, there has been some work by the Competition Bureau on, on digital markets and digital service provisions. There was a call, I think, in late 2019 for, um, you know, submissions, uh, complaints, etc., cetera, um, about digital competition. But again, we don't have any pending cases, um, as there are in the United States, for example, and, you know, in Germany, the Bundeskartellamt has been very active. Um, but, you know, I, I think so, where we're getting to in this conversation, I'm happy that we got there, is that, um, you know, digital policy making, I think, involves lots of trade-offs. Right, there are trade-offs between content regulation, safety, privacy, competition, and sometimes these things have to be traded off against one another. So, we want competition that's good, but do we want Gab as a competitor? Um, content moderation can be costly. Does that mean we want less competition? Uh, privacy, same thing. You know, complying with rules is expensive. So, um, where do we strike these balances? How do we feel about the ad-supported internet more generally? Is that a model that we should regulate using other forms of economic regulation? And right, there's a lot of great work that's been done since Shoshana Zuboff wrote her book, uh, *The Age of Surveillance Capitalism*, that sort of you know asks these fundamental questions. Right, I think we need to um, again work internationally on some of these questions and work across some of these regulatory and disciplinary boundaries um, to grapple with this new technology, right? And we're not gonna get it perfectly right. No regulation ever does. I drove to my office today and there were people speeding uh, on the highway every day, right? Um, but, you know, as Will said, right, we want good enough safety, good enough regulation, right? And how do we get there? And I want to uh, jump into some questions from the audience. Uh, so this is actually something that Laura already touched on, but I'm going to ask it again um, because I want to see if, if anybody has anything else uh, they want to add to it. And the question is, are you worried that we're creating rules that entrench the competitive position of foreign tech giants by creating insurmountable barriers to entry for smaller domestic firms who cannot afford to comply with new and onerous regulations? So my short answer, which I already said is yes, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, but I think specifically, we've actually seen a lot of concrete examples of that, particularly in the US. The lobbying that Facebook is doing around what uh, any amendments to CDA 230 should be are very specifically proposals that are based on how Facebook is doing things and how Facebook wants to do things and how only Facebook can manage it, which actually is quite anti-competitive and prevents others from coming into the market. And I think there is a large call for regulation, in some cases, even from the companies we're talking about, with the assumption that it will actually be in their business interest. And so I think unless we're looking at what the long-term game is that we actually want as an outcome and not just what seems like it's palatable to the companies right now, uh, that will definitely be one of the results. And it's, it's pretty clearly happening before our eyes, I think. Could I just uh, briefly add to Laura? Uh, this comment, which is that, you know, under regulation and, and legislative inertia can also hurt competition. Um, name a large Canadian in internet platform. You can't, because Canada has no, nothing similar to CDA 230 or the e-commerce directive in, the, in, in Europe, right, that provides intermediaries with some protection from liability for stuff that users post. Um, it's a terrible place to start a platform, right? So, um, you know, uh, uh, regulation can be a two-way street, right? There's compliance costs, but you also need to create the right kind of environment. And this is something we're not hearing from the government. Anything about digital innovation, growing the digital economy in Canada is kind of absent. It's fallen off the agenda as far as I can tell. Uh, I, it's a case of uh, regulatory design. Um, if we uh, design bad regulations, yeah, then then the, it will be too onerous for small businesses. But most of the, well, uh, in the EU and in the UK as well, we see a delineation between 
small platforms and very big ones. So I think in the EU, it's um, there's a whole set of rules, um, much more burdensome that apply to platforms with over, I think it's 60 million users in the EU, I can't quite remember. Um, and in, in the UK, they're defining what are called category one platforms, which are clearly going to be the big high risk ones. Um, because there is a great deal of interest in the UK on being a good place to start one of these small businesses. But there's a cultural point here as well. And uh, I imagine, for instance, I'm not sure familiar with the process in Canada, but um, if you're a sandwich chain, if you have a small hole in the wall sandwich bar and you make sandwiches and you sell them through that hole in the wall, um, you have to follow basic food hygiene regulations so that you don't kill your customers. You have to basic cleanliness, uh, refrigeration and so on. Then as you grow to become, a, your business becomes really successful and you grow to become much, much bigger bigger business with, with dozens or hundreds of branches and a massive refrigerated supply chain, um, the regulatory burden on you is much higher because you're, um, it just costs more to, to, to be regulated and to stay safe across that bigger, more complex business. But your basic food hygiene is baked in at the outset when you start. And uh, so that's um, one of the things I hope we can achieve with regulation is saying to businesses, it's not okay to develop and release an unsafe uh, network. So um, it, it remind me, was was Kick? Wasn't that a Canadian network? K I K um, that was popular for a few years. Um, in the UK, it was attached to over a thousand cases of child abuse being investigated by the police, um, and it was a small, a scrappy network, had hundreds of uh, several mil tens of millions of users, I believe, and then segued into a some sort of Bitcoin play, which completely collapsed um, and and dragged the business down. But um, uh, so there has to be a sense of yeah, one has to have some social responsibility. The Jonathan Zittrain, the internet uh, scholar, um, characterized the first 20 or so years of the internet as you know, the John Perry Barlow massive personal freedom era of the internet, which was fantastic. I love that bit. You know, I'm old enough to have been around then. It was great. Um, but Zittrain now says, well, we're now in a public health era of the internet because there was, a lot, there was this, own, this pure individualism led to lots of poor externalities in which in classic microeconomics, you know, costs that fall outside the business onto society as a whole. And that's the era we're in now, the public health era of the internet where we have to improve, uh, improve our hygiene. And we've got another question from the audience, which is from Rachel Khan. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the acceleration of content changes in terms of language, co-opted language that isn't always detected by hate speech mechanisms and other changes that have been observed since the COVID-19 pandemic began. So um, when the COVID uh, pandemic began in the UK, I went to set up a local uh, Facebook group for my village, which had been very traditional and resisted having such a thing uh, to exchange information about COVID. And as I typed COVID, Facebook auto completed for me to a COVID denial group. Um, and, and that's a bad co-option of language by the algorithm um, uh, in, in the way it behaves because the COVID denial group was extremely popular and it tried to make my language mean something else. So that, that's one aspect of that problem. Um, but let's not deny the, the difficulty of, of these linguistic issues. They are extremely hard uh, to tackle and the minister uh, did refer to some of them in, in, in his remarks. Um, and one has to, um, uh, there is a resource issue for the platforms. Are they putting enough effort into understanding and comprehending these things? I often say to people from one of the big search companies, I went name them and I meet them, you know, when you said you were going to index all the world's information, didn't you imagine there would be cultural issues here? I mean, uh, but as, as Kara Swisher always says, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg had just taken a module in humanities at, you know, in as part of his computer science degree, we might be in a different world now. I mean, I think there, the way that language, you know, in the past year has changed uh, is one of many examples of how when you're starting to use algorithms, when you're using AI learning, like, and even when you're using human moderation, it's really hard to know the multiple meanings that a single sentence or a single word can have in the way that it's used. And the context is so important. And that's where, you know, it's, it's really scary to hear the minister even consider things like upload filters. That's proactive censorship of content before it's even been posted by something that is a computer that we have trained to try and understand the context without actually knowing it. That is a dangerous step towards massive censorship in the country if we are considering up, like, upload filters that pre-screen and censor content before it's posted because that context is so variable. And it is really hard for people to get it right, let alone for computers to get it right, particularly when language is changing. It is constantly evolving. The way that we use terms changes. Jokes, 
get looped into that. Memes get looped into that. If you look at the way we talk about our lives now versus a year ago, there are words that exist now that meant very different things a year ago or didn't even you know, exist at all. And I think that's where that evolving nature of language and the way that the context around a sentence can change are so difficult for moderation technologies to manage, let alone people. And I think that's where it's something that will lead to those false positives. And I think when we're looking at things that have those really quick turnarounds or those preventative takedowns with really strong penalties for not doing it, we are going to see that. We are going to see overreaching takedowns because we can't necessarily give people the benefit of the doubt when you're a company who is facing these penalties. And so it is constantly changing. It's really challenging when it comes to content moderation for exactly that reason. Yeah, so I guess the question is, you know, where do we set the balance, right, between false positives and false negatives, right? And Laura mentioned the difficulties in content moderation, right, in determining context. You know, determining the legality of content is really hard, too. We have cases go to the Supreme Court uh, in this country and many others with some frequency to determine if some words are illegal or not, um, or whether some government restriction, you know, in a particular weird factual circumstance is justified or not, right? This is difficult stuff and reasonable people can disagree, right? Um, so then you have sort of a second order question of who should be making the decisions. And, you know, going back to what the minister said about a regulator, um, you know, governments have to uh, provide fair processes, right? They're held to a higher standard uh, than uh, private companies under our law. And there's a reason for that, which is that the government ultimately has a lot of power over us. We can say that private companies are powerful over us too, but they can't exactly imprison us or levy, levy criminal penalties, et cetera, right? So this again gets back to this question of, you know, who sets what rules and who enforces them in what way? And then again, the question of the incentives that we can create as a society to get private organizations to behave better, but also individuals, right? And I think Laura's point about the person behind the computer um, is really, really important. Right? And we need to understand the motivations of people who are spreading harmful content online. Um, we also have to you know, attack that problem in a real and concrete way. And uh, I also wanted to get your thoughts about the other piece of legislation that we're expecting uh, to come sometime this spring and summer, which is the compensation for uh, news outlets. So it's the idea or the for forcing big companies like Facebook and Google to compensate news publishers for articles or for links or, or whatever it's going to look like, but essentially for their, their news content. And, um, you know, where this fits in, obviously, with the, with the question of, of harms to, you know, to, to democracy, digital harms to democracy, is in that the minister said that, you know, Canada doesn't, it's not the government's place to tackle misinformation, but it's the presence of, you know, traditional media that helps provide, uh, you know, that, that helps good information to kind of counterbalance that. So, so how do you see, um, and as obviously Canada is the only country, we've seen this in Australia, we've seen this in France. So how do you see these efforts to force companies like Google and Facebook to compensate companies for news? How do they fit into this whole discussion that we've been having? I mean, this is a, a probably the subject of an event unto itself, I think, if we actually want to dig into this in full detail. Uh, and I'm happy to come back for that one as well but i think you know what we're what we have heard from the minister so far and again very similar to online harms we've heard a lot of kind of ranging talk about what it might be so it, it feels difficult to know what is on the table or being considered without actually getting a concrete answer uh, but i think when we look at what has happened when we hear what has been talked about i think there is pretty universal agreement that news is important <laughs> that we need to make sure that there is information in the public interest that is there and that they're that the news industry is struggling. I mean, I think that's something that we can all agree on. I think one of the things that is really difficult in the way that it's being tackled in Canada is again very similar to the way that we're talking about online harms. We're talking about broadcast, which is really assuming that news industry, just like we're going to do with our broadcast industry, just like we're talking about doing with content moderation, is really hitching its wagon to a select few companies. And I think in the way that it has been discussed from the minister to date, either using you know, the French model, looking at how to apply copyright to news headings as a way to charge a levy for every single time a news article is posted, or if you look at the Australian model, basically trying to use competition, in either case, it means that, to Vivek's point earlier, 
these companies are now the driving force. Their entire business model becomes the driving force for sustaining something in the public interest. And now we need those companies. If we think they're too big, if we think they're not operating in our public interest, it doesn't matter because if we break them up or if we tackle them, we now undermine the funding model we have for our news industry. So now they're way too big to fail or way too big to tackle. And I think if the government thinks this is something in the public interest, then the government has a role to do in funding and supporting it. The same thing they do with everything else they think is important, what they do with the arts, what they do with health, what they do with infrastructure, what they do with things that the public needs. They need to make sure that they are funding it. But I think really concerning is the way that, and I think this to all of the issues the minister talked about earlier today, the underlying mechanisms are all to just make them pay. But the ripple effects of tying all of the things that we want and need as a society to these companies means that great, we see them as a checkbook, they have money, they can help fund it, but what are the ripple effects in terms of how does that make the internet function? How does that actually shift the content we see? And again, to, to the next point, you know, that means that now we're entirely reliant on all of those clicks, all of those things going viral. Um, but I think more importantly, if the more emotional content is free, and the more fact-based content is expensive, then what are the algorithms going to promote? What are we going to be seeing shared? What are people themselves going to share? What are they interested in? And you can't just make people want to see content. It's not how it works. It doesn't work for our cultural content. It doesn't work, you know, in trying to mandate people to watch CanCon. You have to, there is too much choice on the internet now. You have to make things people want, and you have to make people want the news. You have to make them want information. And I think that's a much deeper issue than just well, open up your checkbooks, you need to pay because you know you touch it somehow. And there are really, really massive effects to some of the things being considered far beyond supporting news. I think that that's really good, Laura. And uh, uh, just, I come at this usually from an economics perspective. Um, uh, there's a principle in sort of competition economics that uh, if you are a dominant pro thing, um, providing a service that your competitors and indeed the public should have what's known as fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory access to that service. Um, so given the dominant position in, uh, in the market of, of uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter and so on, um, and the importance of news, it, it, most competition regulators would look at that and say, yeah, well, there should be fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory access. Now, and that is roughly the situation that we have at the minute. Um, because, for instance, um, I, well, I, I'll cast an aspersion at Silvio Berlusconi. Imagine if Silvio Berlusconi owned Facebook. Um, would all the news outlets have fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory access? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I'm happy to debate this with Mr. Berlusconi, you know, if, if he's listening. Um, but uh, so that's a good thing, actually, for democracy, that they do have this fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory access. Um, then the question is, what is the price? Uh, for that and what is the financial exchange around that point and that as Laura quite rightly said is a huge other issue and the Australians have gone down a route maybe Rupert Murdoch is in the background I don't know I can only, only speculate it has to be likely um, that uh, there should be that this content is valuable and it is valuable and it should be paid for but um, from my knowledge of news economics the amount that's being paid for it isn't enough to sustain the future news model it's nowhere near enough um, uh, because news is public service news um, of the type of high quality news that Canada is lucky to have through historic uh, funding of broadcast media and so on similarly in the UK and many European countries not so much in, in the USA um, that's really expensive to produce and in the olden days before the internet came along that was funded by uh, companies making super normal profits, um, profits well above what they would normally make in a free market because they were able to restrict the amount of advertising space that was available to sell. So they earned loads of money which subsidized this news which isn't really economic. And in some cases, such as in Canada and in the UK and France and so on, the government weighed in with a huge amount of taxpayer money through a variety of devices to fund this really expensive news. And in the UK, you know, the BBC has a budget, a government subsidy of about, sorry, it's allowed to collect a tax for £3.6 billion a year, of which about 250 to 300 million, I think, goes on news. So it's, it's a very substantial expenditure. Um, so we have this problem of a good that the market isn't going to produce very well. Um, and we have an issue, which is a separate issue from companies uh, that, um, for which there are competition issues. And you might be able to lever some money out of them through messing around um, with, with access. Um, and then there is this 
particular problem for anyone who works in public policy and tries to approach it with a rational, open and logical mind, which is one has to acknowledge the sheer political heft of the big media brands. It's absolutely huge in most countries, in most democracies. And so they will be able to win themselves a place at the table that new market entrants um, who are doing news in new and interesting ways won't be able to. And that is just really difficult um, and, and not easy to, to resolve. Um, and so um, uh, we've seen the Australian experience in, in, in France. I don't think in France they got as much money as I understand they may have got in Australia. Um, it's not clear yet that they will do this in the UK. There seems to be some debate uh, going on as to whether it's needed, particularly because, as I said, I think the realisation is whilst news media content is valuable, it's not enough money to save the big news organisations. So there's still a second order issue there as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that Laura and uh, Will have said about this issue, right? We had a historical accident in the 20th century of ad-supported high-quality journalism, that, and that model has broken down. And for better or for worse, uh, the advertising market has moved digital, I think mostly for the worse, and we're seeing the substantial harms that digital advertising does on our political system, um, right? And, you know, everyone knows the story of 2016, everyone knows the story of, of you know, hyper-professionalism, micro-targeting, et cetera. Um, so, you know, um, if we want to fund the media, we should fund the media. If we want to extract money from the large technology companies, we should tax them, right? We should tax them appropriately based on the revenues that they generate in this country. And there are international rules um, around allocation of, you know, wh where are your revenues coming from? What's the appropriate taxing authority of a given country, right? So that's the way to do it rather than this targeted levy that breaks the internet in fundamental ways, right? If we're gonna, the French model of copyright for links, right? It distorts copyright law in very fundamental ways, right? There's a basic idea that you can't copyright ideas, that you can use small pieces of copyrighted works freely because you, do, you don't want a monopoly on ideas, right? This breaks it in order to solve a public policy problem by going after one particular deep pocket, right? And that's just bad public policy. Um, so let's create, uh, you know, a system that's going to sustain us for 20, 30, 40 years, right? Durable funding sources um, that are going to be allocated to news media on a non-discriminatory way that promotes diversity and high quality journalism and that favors innovation, right? Uh, there's no reason that traditional media should have first claim to whatever uh, money is put forward, right? There's lots of innovation in this space and, you know, let's, let's do that. But that's a separate conversation. It'd be a great panel. Okay, well, we have... Um, I, I would just, just add, add oh, I'm sorry, one please, tiny point on ahead. that, which is that um, there is precedent in the UK going back uh, maybe 20 years um, of the government uh, regulating B Sky B, a Murdoch-owned business. Uh, to ensure that it set a, a stable menu of prices for people who wanted to buy products from it uh, or and vice versa to get access to its satellite platform. So th there is a body of competition law on all of this. And so, but, but it, as I said, it just gets mashed up in, in raw politics every time um, uh, because of the massive power of um, historic legacy media brands, which is still remains to be, of course, much higher than the actual advocacy power of uh, the big tech companies paradoxically, even though they're bigger and have all the money. And uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll ask one last question. And it is um, just a, a follow up of, of, of what, what we heard just now about, you know, we risk breaking the internet. So I wanted to get your thoughts in all of these, you know, regulatory efforts that we're seeing in Canada that we're seeing around the world, do we risk breaking the internet? I'm deeply concerned. <clears throat> um, I've been concerned for a number of years. This has sort of been a theme of my work for the last five or six years, that the internet is breaking apart in several big ways, right? The first is that I think we've lost China and the authoritarian countries in its orbit, to use Will's powerful uh, metaphor, right? Russia, China, these countries are not going to be part of the global open internet anymore for architectural reasons right, uh, pervasive filtering, et cetera. They've created their own ecosystem of companies. So the real questions, I think, from the international perspective is where do countries like India and Brazil end up, right? Uh, countries that are flawed democracies. Are they going to be part of the, let's call it, Western democratic internet um, or not, 
right? And I think we see very troubling signs that those countries are moving towards a splinter net model, right? Of erecting strong barriers. Um, and I think that tendency is accelerated by us in countries like Canada, you know, again, erecting these national walls of regulation uh, instead of working internationally. You know, we're part of an organization in Canada called the Freedom Online Coalition that brings together about 40 democratic governments that are committed to internet freedom, right? So I think it's in the balance as we speak. So this is an area of, of question. There's another question around uh, regulation of data flows, data localization mandates, another great panel to have. Um, so it's a moment of great peril to see if this version of the internet that we've enjoyed can survive or whether we're going to have something that's much, much more nationally splintered, right? And I really hope that we are able to get this right because I think there's been a lot of value um, in what we've built. Uh, despite its flaws and imperfections. Okay, well, I see that we're at uh, 1.45, so unfortunately we will have to leave it there. Um, it's been great talking to or hearing all of you talk and, and discuss these issues. So, uh, Laura, well, uh, Vivek, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And you.